you get the current flow between these two, that's where you, you get a measurable current that you can then calibrate to a vacuum. And here's your magnet to create the magnetic field. So instead of just going from near inside here to the side, it's going to spiral around and around and, and hopefully hit more gas molecules. So you can pass that around. So this, someone broke this. So that's why that's. Not too exciting. This is your parotid gauge, so I don't have anything more to show you other than there's a sealed unit inside there for your, your calibration against your tube opening up out into the, your, your, your chamber. And the larger the opening, the better, uh, better for your measurements and for pumping vacuum because you're not, you don't want to force things through a narrow opening. You want as big an opening as possible to make these gas molecules move as easily as possible so you can suck them out of there. All right, here is your mechanical pump. This one's just a single valve, not a double valve. And in, in this case, the valve that goes up and down is on the outside, not on the inside vein. So it's a little bit different. Watch the movie on, on the uh, blackboard. But as you turn this, you can see that the, the chambers change size. And so that's how, as it rotates, forces air so you've got intakes and exhausts depending on of course which way you turn this so you can turn that if you want to see up close how this is changing the volumes to move the gas through and out of in your system so this would be a mechanical pump all of this is sitting in oil that's why you have to worry about it sucking the oil back out of the system here is your your jet engine with the bird catcher want to have particles so in our case we we don't want particles of our sample going on in to hit it here are our stators you slide so you can see it's not occupying a lot of space there's your rotor round and round so in the oil old days they used to have oil in the bearings here for this to keep lubricated when the when the oil dried out, then that's when you'd have a pump failure. Uh, but then they went away from that because they didn't want oil in your system to then contaminate your, your microscope column. So then they went to magnetic bearings, and as long as, as you don't have, if you get a, if you hit it or something, you can cause it to, to go to side to side, and once it hits the side of the chamber, then you're toast. Especially when you're, you're talking at 90,000 RPM. So rotors are the one part of the rotating and it's multiple levels. You can see how many different levels there are here and there's stators in between each level. And they're knock, it's an impact pump because if you impact the gas molecule and knock it down to the next level. So this is your oil diffusion pump. You might think that this is working by diffusion but it's actually also an impact pump. Here is your percolator upside down funnel so if you pass this around you can see there are holes underneath the shields this looks kind of like something from a Japanese um, samurai movie with the kind of helmet they wear <laughs> but in our case we use it for generating vacuum so you can pass that around it sits inside here and you saw how tight a fit it was in this case we have water cooling so that as it squirts out the different levels there it hits the sides here it gets condensed as oil comes down to the bottom it gets reheated there's a heater on the bottom and then here's our side off off to our mechanical pump so that as the pump fills with these gas molecules they get removed this one is also also one what's the difference between these two also has a multi-stage, but this one isn't water-cooled, it's air-cooled. So as this, as this spins here, the fan is going to cool these ribs here to cool it down. Now the problem with this one is that this heat is liberated into the lab, so then you have to have good air conditioning to, to cool the room down. This one, you're wasting water, 
hook, what can you do? Well, you can hook this up to a recirculator, then you're using electricity to cool the water, which then flows through your, your pipes. So there are drawbacks to all of these. Right now, of course, in San Diego, the biggest problem is these water cooled things. But in a place like this, I can't put an air cooled cooler. I have a water cooler because an air cooler would liberate all of the heat into the rooms here. And you already know how hot these rooms get when you start closing the doors and whatnot. So that's a real problem that they thought about when they when they make them. But we're on the ground floor so that we should have minimized vibration. Uh, there's an elevator in the next building. I had to have them test it to see whether or not as the elevator goes up and down that electromagnetic field that's created by this huge mass moving up and down would affect my microscopes. That's why our scanning microscope here, which is really sensitive to that kind of thing, has those wires in three different directions. It's actually generating a magnetic field. So when you use the microscope, there's a magnetic field being created artificially to cancel out the magnetic field that might be in the surrounding rooms. And if I put that microscope any closer to the wall, it would start affecting the microscope in the next room. So they're gonna build, I just found out today, that was the meeting I was at, they're building a new engineering building. And they mentioned that they want to put a magnetic resonance imaging center in there. <laughs> this is the first time anyone's mentioned it to me. This is like back in Texas. They put in a, they put in something in a different department on the third floor up from where they had the electron microscopes. It practically ruined the microscope because it was a different department. Nobody thought to mention that they were bringing in this magnetic field generator. And that's why you have your MRI units out in the parking lot so that they're not screwing up all the electronic equipment inside. Because those things, you have to take your watches off and everything. You have to be really careful around those so you don't get sucked. Have these things sucked off your off your wrist here. All right, those are my toys. So uh, next week, uh, depending on how the scope is working, we may try a Tomo run or not. And we'll have uh, some more odds and ends to talk about in lecture. Hopefully, it won't be quite as long as this one. But. This is the problem with this kind of a setup. I used to have a class and a lecture, uh, a lecture class and a lab class, which you would take together. If you had space for the lab, you could take the lecture by itself. But then they don't allow me to teach the lecture anymore, so now you learn to run these things, but you don't know how they work. So I've got to get it in there somehow. So now that you all have enough to do, learning how to cut slices and everything, now I can start backfilling with how things work and why you're cutting these slices, for example why you're staying on the way you are. So I apologize that there isn't an easier way to do that. If you have an idea, I'm always open to a different way to teach the class. But since, since I, I have to present the material to you somehow, because as you've demonstrated, if we don't have deadlines and tests, it doesn't get done. <laughs> Sorry, what can I say? All right, that's, that's all for today. If there are no more questions, so please.